at that. Fantastic. So as long as I can actually, yeah, there we go. Is that working? Don't, yeah, don't change that. That that that's wonderful. And we have brilliant. Thank you for your help, everyone. I better just shut my door so I don't wake my wife up. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Mark Bailey. Thank you. That was very you're you're so adroit at that. Thank you. That's a good word, particularly this for this time of night. <laughs> it's still it's seven here, and we are recording, friends. So. Well, welcome to Stamp Chat, everybody. This is Heidi from the American Philatelic Society, and I am just pickled, peached, and pickled, and, and everything like that because we have the punk philatelist here on the Stamp Chat tonight, and it's always such a thrill. I don't know why. Maybe it's kind of just um, the, the time differences and how we all, no matter what, it's like a, it's like a moth to a light, you know, that we all come to join together uh, when, when our curiosity is peaked, no matter the time zone, no matter where in the world. And I think that that's a really exciting component of philately. And every time I see your faces and, I, and, I, and, and a guest does us the honor of, you know, putting forth the effort to join us no matter where they are in the world, I truly appreciate it. And that, that speaks volumes to you, friends, as EPS members. We so appreciate your support during this time and your your membership that you had prior, and and we know that we can count on you to continue to help us bring you Stamp Chat, bring you the American Philatelist, the Digital Library, Stamp Insurance, Estate Planning, just a myriad of sources. Not to mention being able to sell and buy on Stamp Store with over three hundred thousand pieces of stamps and postal ephemera. So that's really cool. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us on the line, especially the punk philatelist. What a what a sensation on uh, social media. What a great logo. Really bodes well for the hobby. And I really appreciate that you're taking the time to, to come on board and to share what brought you to the hobby, you know, what it is that piques your interest and that you get excited about and that you want to share. So. Thank you so much, Gerard, and thanks everybody for joining us on the call. And I'll uh, I'll take everybody. You can please put your questions in the chat. I'll be watching them. I will call on you. I know that sounds sort of, you know like teacherish, but I'll I'll say your name because I know some of you guys want to actually ask your questions. So I'll give you about three seconds, and then the, the awkward silence is going to be put down, and I'll ask your question or share your comment. Okay, so. Feel free to use the chat box and um, I'll turn it over to you, Gerald. Well, thank you very much, Heidi. One moment, Gerard. The hard way. Sure. Okay, there, your, your internet's better. Oh, okay. Uh, do let me know if it gets a bit fuzzy. I have an emergency backup option. So, um, are we are we better now? If I yes, you start waving start waving your hands practically if there's any further problem. Will do. So uh, yes. So thank you everyone for joining. My my talk is called Collect Modern Stamps the Hard Way, and the reason for that is that modern stamps are very easy to get your hands on, but try getting them on commercial covers, and it becomes much harder. So. Uh, of course, anything that I say about uh, modern stamps, I'll be using Australian modern stamps in my examples, but most of what I say would apply to stamps from all around the world. And uh, when I talk about commercial covers, uh, I, it, that, what I say applies to stamps from any era, really. But uh, the reason that I'm specifically talking about modern stamps is that, as I said, modern stamps are very easy to find, but uh, it's fun if you try to collect them on commercial cover. I'll tell more of that story along the way as we go. My name's Jared McCulloch. I've been a stamp collector since my youth, and then like many people, gave it away in my teens for about 20 years there. <laughs> my teens went for 20 years, and then um, found it again towards the end of my 20s and really got back into it again. And I also write a blog called Philatelist. So uh, if you haven't already swung by, go along and check it out. I try to have a, uh, a, a voice that's a little bit irreverent. It takes an irreverent approach to stamp collecting and, uh, and the philatelic hobby in general. I don't hate on everything. Uh, I do a lot of loving too, so swing on by. But I thought that uh, today I might put the, the punk persona aside. I'm with friends here. I'm really gonna enjoy the chance to just 
really nerd out for a little bit and uh, and enjoy the fact that uh, I can talk about stuff that we're all into. So, excuse me, it's nine o'clock in the morning here. I've still got a bit of morning breath. I will be <laughs> sipping occasional water. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. So, let me uh, let me take you through. I've got a few screens here to um, operate this show. Let me take you through how I came to collecting commercial covers. Now, when I was a kid in the 80s, I was collecting a lot of 70s and 80s material. It's colorful, it's vibrant, it really speaks to me a lot about a, a nation that was still clawing its way out from under the weight of empire and, and trying to find its new place in the world. Australia, of course, is where I'm talking about. I, I did mention that earlier, but just a reminder of where I'm coming from. And as I returned to the hobby as a grown up, of course, I was no longer just soaking stamps off the mail as it came in. I had a bit of disposable income. I could pretty much have chosen any, any era of stamps, any country. In Australia, some of our early issues are very popular, they're known as kangaroos or the King George heads. But I found myself drawn continually back to this era that I grew up in. I just love these designs. Now, there's a problem if you decide you're gonna collect this era. There are a couple of problems actually. Um, I should point out that uh, when I talk about modern Australian stamps, I'm using a pretty broad frame of reference. By the way, am I talking too uh, fast in my crazy Australian accent or are we okay? We're okay? All right, I'll carry on. Yeah, you're so, okay with me. Uh, brilliant, thank you for that. Now, uh, my frame of reference is Australian modern, de sorry, Australian decimal stamps. Australia in 1966 converted from pounds, shillings and pence through uh, into the Australian dollar which is worth 100 cents. And if you're ever sorting stamps from Australia from this era, take a very good look because you might think you have a duplicate, but you don't because a bunch of those stamps are the same except the currency changed, just like Abel Tasman there. So I, I'm more into the, the later end of the 20th century, but for me, modern stamps means anything decimal and Australian. And the problem with this stuff is the same problem that hit many countries back in the 70s and the 80s. There was a stamp boom. And I remember even as a child, everybody's dad going down to the post office, uh, but down to the post office and investing in stamps. And I think even today, people walk into stamp dealers, they've hauled dad's stash out of the bank vault and they want to know how many millions of dollars of richness they're going to get. And uh, of course, it's, it's all pretty worthless now because the boom turned into a bust and material is now considered rubbish, which was a problem for me when it comes to finding a challenge in collecting. If I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great to own every decimal stamp? And it turns out I could, I spent a couple of hundred bucks in an afternoon and I had it over. So not much of a challenge there. And the other problem that you have if you collect modern stamps is that if you're buying them from post offices as they come out, post offices have been treating us like cash cows for a very long time. They obviously need their profit margins. They're under a lot of pressure from governments and they know that if they, they can sell collectors stamps, they will never have to actually come through with the postal services for them. And in some countries, it just became impossible to keep up. Uh, here in Australia, I drew a line after the year 2000 because after that, it just got, it got more and more ridiculous. Um, we'd already started, for example, giving out gold medal uh, stamps for Olympic gold medalists, which is dangerous. And then one year we hosted what's called the Commonwealth Games, which is where all the former nations of the British Empire get together. And basically here's who doesn't come to the Commonwealth Games, the USA, China, Russia, all of Eastern Europe, most of Europe actually. So Australia wins a lot of medals. Um, in fact, we won 107 medals that year and everybody got a stamp. 100, <laughs> actually we won slightly less than 107 medals. But uh, those stamp issues included the, the five highlights from the opening ceremony and the 10 highlights of the whole games. That was ridiculous. I wasn't going to buy 107 new stamps. And so I didn't. Now, that's why I uh, have stopped collecting modern stamps as stamps. For a little while, I looked for a challenge by chasing missing colors. But again, they're just out there. The only question is how much money do you have and how much do you want to spend? There was no real challenge there. But something I did always enjoy as a kid and something I got into as an adult was first day covers. I always found first day covers, even these, these official Australia Post first day covers, so vibrant, so colourful. There's something really likeable, I think, about having the, the, 
seeing stamps on an envelope, it's so tactile. They just feel, they feel substantial, way more substantial than holding a stamp. So, uh, but uh, first aid covers, they have the same problem as the stamps. Everyone invested in the boom. They're just a dime a dozen. They're really easy to get a hand off, uh, get a hand on, I should say. Some of the more recent ones, less so. But this was about the time in my collecting where it was suggested that I could perhaps level up to commercial covers. So uh, I should say that my interest in commercial covers was stoked particularly by a columnist that we had here in the Australian magazine Stamp News Australasia. His name was Rod Perry. He was a legend of philately here in Australia. He was a, a medal winning collector, a dealer, an auctioneer. And he wrote this column for many years where he, he really preached the values of collecting on commercial cover and alerted many readers to the fact that even in uh, even in modern times, commercial covers can be very hard to find. Now, very sadly, we lost Rod just last week. Uh, he had been sick for a while. You probably, I don't believe it was COVID related, if that was the first thing that popped into your mind. He's going to be a huge loss, but he leaves behind what is probably one of the world's most developed uh, collector communities when it comes to collecting commercial covers. It's It's a real uh, a bit of a boom scene here in Australia. I shouldn't say boom. I don't mean like there's going to be a bust. I mean, there's a very active collector community for commercial covers as a result of, of Rod's proselytizing. Um, he was also well known for liking a glass of red. So it's nine o'clock in the morning here in Australia, but it's it's one o'clock everywhere else in the world. So I'd just like to raise my glass to Rod and uh, thank him for all his work. Now, what's the commercial cover. Now I realize I may be talking a lot to the converted here on this particular talk, but of course this talk will stick around on YouTube. People might come looking for a bit more information about it. So some of this uh, I may be telling you stuff that you know, but uh, I'll, I'll, it's here for posterity anyway. So commercial covers is the mail. It's stamps going about their job, doing their duty. And when I say commercial covers, it refers to the envelopes. It does actually include some other stuff, which I'll get onto soon but it definitely does not include other, other stuff. Essentially, it's stamps acting as receipts for the payment of a postal service. So we'll learn a bit more about that as we go along. Why would you collect commercial covers? Well, they're postally meaningful. Unlike buying a first day cover from the post office and taking it home and putting it in an album, these are covers that have actually done their job. They've been through the post. The stamps have meaning because they've actually conveyed someone's message from one part of the world to another. They're personal. The one you're looking at is personal. It uh, was. It dates back to a time when I was studying in Damascus uh, before the war in Syria. Um, beautiful city back then. And uh, back then internet was banned because of course it was the early days of the internet and I was in a dictatorship, but I came to rely very much on letters from home and a friend sent me this one and I was very grateful to get a, a Christmas card at Christmas. Just like first day covers, they're tactile. As I said before, they're fun to hold. I just think they're like little artifacts. They're like little bits of history. Sometimes I'll get a cover and I'll go and look up where it got sent and on Google Maps, I'll be able to find the post box it got put into across the other side of the world. It's exciting stuff. And of course, they're just attractive. They can be really great to look at. The one we're looking at is an example. Not always, you learn to love the ugly ones, but they can also, sometimes you just pick up a, a cover and you go, oh, oh, I like that one. So. Uh, so that's some of the attractions of commercial covers. Oh, and by the way, they can also be scarce. It's funny just how scarce some of even quite recent issues are, especially compared to the stamps of the, uh, or the, to the equivalent stamps. The set you're looking at there comes from 1987. It's about a well-known poem in Australia called The Man from Snowy River. It came out to pay the base rate domestic postage of 36 cents. It was only valid for about five days. Now it's really hard to find these stamps on commercial covers within that five day window. I have the full set of five. The top three covers are within those five days, but the other two there, uh, they came after the price of postage went up. So technically they're an underpayment or an under franking. So they don't really count. They do count as commercial covers, but they don't count as base rate postage. Now I'm starting to use a bit of terminology I might be starting to lose you. So I thought what I could do is run through some of the terms that you'll encounter. This is not really a comprehensive list. It's just some of the terms that get bandied about, certainly amongst the Australian commercial collector community. And I've certainly seen many of these words used around the world too. So perhaps later on you could 
um, tell me if there's any other words that get used in your neck of the woods. Uh, to illustrate my examples as we go, I'll be using a lot of examples from this series. Oh, by the way, I'm going to call it Under the Covers this segment. Welcome to Under the Covers with Punk Philatelist. So this series is from 1988. It was called Living Together. Now, 1988 was a big year in Australia because we were celebrating, get this, 200 years of white people living in the country. Now, it pales by comparison to the at least 60,000 that our Aboriginal brothers and sisters have been here, but we were not going to let that stop us from having a party. So this was one of several bicentennial themed stamps that came out. 26 values in all and the fun about trying to collect this set on cover is that a bunch of them are sort of small rates make up values no particular meaning some of them were for specific postal rates and some of those postal rates were obvious ones like the base rate or the zone 5 air mail off to europe but some of them are very obscure and trying to find the full set on commercial cover is a great challenge. It is actually the most popular set to collect if you get into this field here in Australia. And I would recommend maybe thinking about it anywhere in the world because of course stamps tend to fly off all over the world. You could actually find some rarities locally. I'll talk a bit more about that as we go. But this series, uh, it features cartoons. Each one was drawn by a different cartoonist to humorously depict an aspect of Australian life and uh and it, it is very popular they're just great fun stamps to look at you may have seen some pop up in your own collections uh having said that i haven't chosen one of these stamps to kick off my first exam this is what we call a solo franking now franking basically means how is the postage being paid what how many stamps are on it it's not always stamps sometimes there are meter markings or other forms of payment but this is a solo franking there's one stamp doing one job and that's what we love we will pay a little bit more to get a stamp on a solo cover and some stamps are very hard to get on solo covers uh, this envelope is an example of a greetings envelope this series has been running in australia for gee i don't know 50 years or maybe more they're highly collectible envelopes in themselves in fact these these covers people collect them on uh, just just for the covers you can find the mint they can actually go for quite a bit of money some of them are very scarce now um i have a bit of a side collection in this in these covers but i set a very high bar what i like is for the stamp on the cover to actually directly relate to the place depicted on the cover but luckily for our friend the eastern water dragon he does actually live on the fabulous gold coast so he would actually make it into That's a, solo cover. That's one stamp on its own. Of course, they can also show up in pairs. We'd call it a pair if it was off cover and a pair on cover. Sometimes we'd also call them duo or dual usage. That's a pair of living together military service off to Poland, which is an interesting destination. Of course, pairs are just one example of multiples and you can get multiples. They're lots of fun on commercial cover too. Bit of an ugly cover, this one. Bit of an ugly fish. It's called a stonefish. Step on one of these and you'll die. Welcome to Australia. Enjoy your swim. So uh, these are paying... 40 cents, the, the postal rate was 37 cents at the time. So it's a slight overpayment, but it, it counts. It went through the post. So it is fine by us. And as I said, you, don't look, you learn to love the ugly covers because if it's a rare franking, you will not care how ugly it is, like a child. Uh, and combination for combo frankings, that's where stamps are working together to bring the value of whatever is required. Here we have one living together stamp working with two others in uh in total combination for this cover something that uh, this is a bit of a side note really but if you're collecting this era in australian stamps you may have seen this pop up those little animals pop up on the side living together was the first time that australia used a system that holds to this day where when they do a reprint it gets a koala the second reprint is two koalas and so on through to four koalas and then when the fifth reprint is a kangaroo and then the koalas start again so one kangaroo and a koala, you're looking at a sixth reprint. There are people who collect this as a specialty field as well. Very cute stuff. Now, um, the frankings, I'm done with frankings. Let's move on to an idea called usage. Now, this is where commercial covers really get very excited. So usage, we've, we've, we've figured out what's on the cover. The question now is, what is it being used for? What rate is it paying? What services? are these stamps paying? Uh, you will hear commercial covers collectors say things like, ah, nice usage. And that's what we're talking about. It means that's something you don't see very often. 
here are just a couple of examples of how you might find stamps doing usage. The very common version is the base rate. So this is a 37 cent stamp just paying domestic postage. And that's what base rate means. It's how much does it cost to send a letter in your country? There's a nice, beautiful postmark on that cover and uh, a little bit of an advertising cow never hurts for a bit of cover, a bit of, bit of dollar as well. Then of course you get other rates. Now, sometimes those rates will be common, like for example, an airmail rate to a country with, uh, with a lot of connections to your country would be quite common. Something like this, a bit less common. This is the Living Together 53 cent primary industry stamp. And it's paying, wait for it, the intrastate surface mail rate for non-standard articles. So these are the kind of rates that uh, cover collectors get very excited about. I just love speeding, spitting out some of these, some of these uh, rate names. And of course you get up into the second weight step or the third weight step, or is it going air mail or surface air lifted mail or sea mail, all the variations are, are lots of fun to play with. Up rates are when a stamp is applied to increase the value of postage on the cover. So what we have here is a pre-stamped envelope. It's worth 39 cents, but the price of uh, postage has gone up to 41. So they are two one cent stamps from the Living Together series uh, depicting religion. And they've been stuck on the pre-stamped envelope to create quite a beautiful little artifact there. And uh, we move on to specific services. Sometimes you can figure out that stamps are doing a, a specific job. This cover breaks down very easily. It has $10.75 worth of postage on it. 75 cents is paying airmail up to Papua New Guinea next door. And $10 is paying security post. Now, why I like this cover is that uh, high value stamps are generally hard to find on commercial articles. The reason is that they usually are used to pay for heavy objects, uh, big mail, stuff that gets ripped apart to get to the object inside, or they're on big covers that no one wants to store away. So having a, a high value stamp, like a $10 stamp on a small article like that is um, something that I, I like having. Combined services, that's when a stamp is paying, doing two or more jobs at the same time. So this cover needed 20 cents for airmail to the USA and 20 cents for a registration fee. And it could be all done by one 40 cent stamp. Hang on a minute, that stamp looks familiar. That's Abel Tasman. I think we've seen him before. That's right, we saw him back when I was talking about decimal currency. And in fact, the stamp on the right hand side is actually the stamp from that cover, which I digitally removed, which is why the perfs look a little bit fuzzy there. But the big chunk taken out of the top left corner is there. Now I have to ask, this is really the crux of my whole talk. Would you rather own this stamp with the, with the bite taken out of the top left corner and an indistinct postmark, or would you rather see it in its original glory on the cover where you can see the beautiful circle of the postmark, you can see the job the stamp did. This is why I like collecting commercial covers. It's just way more interesting than looking at stamps. Uh, now, uh, there's another couple of categories of usage I thought I'd share with you. One is called combination or sometimes makeup use. Uh, working together, you add them all up and they're providing the fee. So for example, here we have $1, $0.20 and $0.10 cent living together stamps and they are um, paying for $1.30 zone for airmail. Now, I hate to confuse you, but I have to say that what I'm showing you, these the six categories you're looking at, there's a lot of crossover between them. A letter, for example, can be uprated for a specific service or a, a combination could be an uprate. Um, a, and I know, I've used the word combination a bit because we saw combined frankings before. Combined frankings usually go hand in hand with combination usage, not always. But uh, I don't want you to think you, we're drawing lines here. Everything's a bit of an overlap. Uh, the more you get into it, the more you'll understand the way that this sort of language works. Something interesting about usage collecting is that underpayments are legitimate. Now, they're also generally very scarce. No stamp that is worth less than the current mail letter rate should be on its own on a, stamp, on a cover because you're not allowed to pay for postage with less money than it's meant to cost you. What you're really doing is relying on idiots from this case, what, 20, 35 years ago. You're relying on them to not realize how much meant, how, how big a stamp they're meant to put on their mail. So in this case, some idiot has put a 
two cent stamp on a cover when they're supposed to be paying 37 cents. Somehow it's got through the mail, maybe because it was going to a charity and the postman decided to be lenient. Uh, we we collect these because they're elements, they, they show that stuff got through the mail, they're just that little bit of, of postal history. And they can be very hard to find. I know that I've never seen a one cent living together on its own on an article. I know that the great Rod Perry once wrote that he'd only ever seen it once. So if you ever happen to find a one cent stamp on, an, on its own on a cover, you might be up for a broad reckoned it would go for one or two hundred dollars at auction. That's Australian dollars, which I think these days might be absolute rubbish overseas, but hey, what can you do? Um, underpayments, we call them. Sometimes you see them called underbrankings as well. That's another word. Of course, if an underpayment gets caught, you may end up with a tax cover where it's had a, a tax applied. And sometimes that tax is paid in the form of another stamp. And that's exciting for us because that means you've got another usage of that stamp. I'm sorry, I didn't have an example to show you. Here in Australia, what happens is they'll deliver the mail anyway, and then you might get a card that looks something like this. In this case, this card says, hey, this item was underpaid, you owe us 96 cents. And so you have to go and buy the stamps and send this card back to the post office, which is how I have this very unusual usage of a 95 cent living together stamp in a combination franking with a one cent lawn bowls stamp to pay the 96 cents postage owing. There are, of course, other postal fees and services. And this is what I meant when I said earlier on that my talk of commercial covers includes other stuff. Here's some of the other stuff that we're talking about. Um, this here is a receipt for a mail redirection order. Someone was heading away for a few weeks and it cost them $3.25 and that was receipted in the form of these living together stamps. I haven't seen a, a higher number of 45 cent living together stamps on an article. It might be out there to be found somewhere, but it's got a lovely postmark. It's a really lovely article to have. This came up at auction here in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago. I can't believe it didn't sell. Uh, it's not living together. It's earlier than that. It's a beautiful 60 series with birds on it. And this is a 30 cent stamp. Uh, a, a, an Australian Air Force serviceman in Vietnam may be sending a talix back to his girlfriend in Queensland and had to pay 30 cents. Now this this stamp, this is just a gorgeous usage of, of this stamp and I'm surprised there are about four different collecting fields I would have thought would have been interested in this article but maybe we were all busy sheltering from coronavirus and we weren't looking at the auction listings. Uh, thanks to Phoenix Auctions for letting me use the image. It's still available if this kind of thing floats your boat. You can go and grab it. Just briefly, a couple of other fun parts of commercial covers. Of course, mail heads out. Things oh, can show up on the other side of the world and very often not recognized for their scarcity. Here's someone applying for a green card to America with a dinosaur stamp. I enjoy collecting something I call stupid multiples. I love finding an, an article of, co of, of usage that is completely commercial and yet for some reason somebody has used a stupid number of stamps on it. Here is a 50 cent you, uh, domestic cover, 10 cents is being paid by an owl, and there are 20 10 pin bowling stamps worth two cents paying the rest. If you think I've miscounted, I haven't, they're on the back. I really enjoy stupid multiples is what I call it. That's my stupid multiple collection. They also can just be beautiful. I alluded to it earlier, but these, these covers can just be beautiful to look at. This is a, a pre-stamped envelope, which has been operated by a rose stamp to pay priority paid. Now, in case you're wondering, this, this would count as a dual franking because the envelope's paying a bit and the stamp's paying a bit, but it counts as a solo usage of the stamp for most cover collectors I know anyway. The stamp's not paying the full rate, but it is the only stamp stuck to the cover. That's the way that you can find solos. Postal history, of course, the talk of commercial covers does feed into the world of postal history, which is where you might be looking at postal routes and, uh, and destinations and what, what it costs, how it got there, all that sort of stuff. Have a look at this stamp. If you had off cover, all it would have on it is a couple of dot matrix dots for a cancellation. It would be very dull. But look at it on cover, you can see it's gone all the way over to Ireland where the Irish Post has decided that it doesn't have enough of an address on it. They've chucked a, a, a big, They've thunked a big stamp on it and they've put a sticker on it and they've drawn crayon on it and they've sent it all the way back to Australia. And it's got a couple of extra stickers on it just for a bit of value. This is just, this, is, this whole cover tells a story and it's a story that you would not have known if you'd soaked that stamp off a cover. Now finally, errors and varieties. 
you can start, you can find really interesting stuff on covers just as you would find them on stamps. So if you can look through the tulips, somewhere in there is a vintage truck. Now every Australian stamp since 1989 has the date on it. If it's not part of the inscription, it will be hiding there in microprint. And this truck is meant to have the date right there next to the windmill. For some reason, one in every 10 booklet stamps missed it. So this is a known variety. This stamp would be, we would assume, 10 times more scarce on cover than its brothers with the date. So anything you can find on a stamp, you can probably go looking for on a cover and see how you go. Now you may have noticed if you're paying attention that some of these stamps actually, uh, uh, they come from later than 2000. I mentioned earlier on that I don't collect Australian stamps after the year 2000, not in a big way anyway, but I do collect covers. In fact, remember these guys that turn me off stamp collecting? Do I collect them on cover? You betcha. I, uh, in fact, I, I can't get enough of them. Like quite literally, they are so rare that I cannot get enough of them. I've got about a third of them and they are very hard to find. In fact, if you uh, are ever going through dealer's boxes and you find modern covers with a colour photo of an Australian stamp waving a gold medal around, hang on to that. It's probably pretty rare because I don't know how many people even buy them, but they're generally bought as souvenirs to keep. They're not generally bought to put on the mail. So I do actually have a bit of an affection for those stamps, but only on commercial items. You're probably thinking, oh yeah, Jared, but do you have a stupid multiple? Oh, you bet I do. Check that out. 23 stamps of Liesl Jones and her gold medal, waving it around on a, that's actually on a full uh, parcel box. I have to admit, if you get into this field, you're gonna need a little bit of storage space. That box, well, I can flatten it, but it still takes up a bit of space in my cupboard. Now, I, I'm, I haven't been keeping track of how I'm going for time, but there's, we're about two thirds of the way through folks, because if I've convinced you that cover collecting is something worth taking up, then you get to play a game that cover collectors get to play on a regular basis. And it's called, is it commercial? Da, 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 da. See, the thing is, sometimes covers look commercial, but they're not. There's a couple that we can rule out very quickly. First day covers are uh, not, they're, they're, even if they've gone through the mail, they don't count. Let's get rid of them. Commemorative covers, similarly, sure, they have nice postmarks, they can be sent through the mail, but they're not commercial mail. Out they go. Flight covers, again, they can be very rare. They can, make, they can really be worth some money, but you know what, not interested. Now, why am I putting a bullet through all these covers? It's because you have to ask yourself a simple question. If somebody wasn't trying to create a philatelic artifact, would this cover exist in its present form? And that helps you work out which covers are philatelically contrived. And it's, it's a little bit blurry. Like I'm prepared to allow for someone to have at least had the consideration to buy an interesting stamp rather than a boring one. But this is the line. And you, it, they just, they lose something if they feel a little bit unnatural. So the two examples I've got there, the one at the front at the bottom, that's strange. You would have thought most post offices would have had the stamp that would pay MAL to the USA. How very weird that the post office had nothing but six very different stamps to pay that rate. That's made a collector very happy, but it's not making me happy. Uh, that is not going in my collection. Full booklet panes on covers, bit of a danger sign. They're not always bad, but in this case, there's enough going on in this cover that makes me think, I, I think that's been put together for a collector. My computer's telling me that I have a slow network connection. Are you all okay? Can I get a thumbs up, Heidi? Are you still hearing me all right? I'm getting thumbs up all around actually. Okay, so um, start waving your hands frantically if, uh, if you, I'm just, I'm just shutting down one or two other applications just to, uh, just to be sure. And then I'll be straight back to the talk. There we and go. Uh, Gerard, if, so, you yes. shut, if you shut off your camera, that'll also help. I mean, we love seeing your face, but oh, okay. it does help with the uh, broadband. Yeah. Or... I hear what you're saying, yeah, Heidi. You don't want to see my face. Who no, does? I no. do. Okay, well, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. We're looking at these beautiful covers anyway. That's so um, you know what that means? Like now I can get stuck into the wine and no one will judge me. <laughs> so um, full booklet panes, yes, as I was saying, they're not always bad news, but they can be a little bit iffy. Anyway, in either case, neither of these covers are really counting for my collection. 
And also, I haven't actually got uh, an illustration of it, but another tip off is if the cover hasn't been opened, that's a sure sign that it's philatelic. Because why would someone get a cover in the mail, get a letter, and then go, you know what, I'm not going to open this letter, I'm just going to put it in my collection. Um, so I'm going to put a bullet through those two as well. Uh, look at this beautiful cover. It's got a big, gorgeous Autotron block from Christmas 1972. I, I thought this smelled a little bit because it doesn't quite make up a rate that was current at the time. And by the time I found four other covers with four other blocks, all addressed to the same guy, the jig was up. And uh, I just know that those ones, I mean, they're beautiful to look at. They, they're still fun to own, but they are definitely philatelically contrived. <laughs> Out they go. And finally, uh, non-contemporaneous usage. And I must say, stamp dealers are notorious for this. They use up the stock they can't sell by putting old stamps on covers. So the stamp you're looking at here at the moment came out in 1998. I think I do own it on another cover. But on this one, if you look very carefully at the dot matrix post the stamp there, you can see it was being used in September 2006. So eight years after it came out, that's a little bit too far in the case of this particular stamp. Sometimes definitive stamps hang around for a long time and it would have been fine, but not for this one. Now let's see who's been paying attention. What reprint is the possum stamp up to? One kangaroo, two koalas. If you said seven, everyone's on mute, but if you said seven, then you guessed right. Anyway, putting a bullet through that one as well. I should say though, it's a bit of a, there's a bit of a debate in our collecting community and I'm on the side that says that not all stamp dealer philatelic mail is bad. Just to be clear, I'm talking about philatelic industry, not philatelically contrived. So this here is uh, probably an order form or something. It's been sent off to a stamp firm in Tasmania from Melbourne. It's even got, slightly annoyingly, a philatelic sales centre postmark. But that was an operating post office. Maybe someone who worked at Australia Post or a collector was sending off their bid form to an auction. This is a mail auction firm. Now, this is a perfectly fine envelope. The stamp is contemporaneous. The, the envelope's been opened. It's an envelope that's doing its job. Just because it was sent from a collector to a stamp dealer doesn't make it a bad envelope. But I will admit that if I found an equivalent from an average Joe, I would probably go for the average Joe envelope and sell off the stamp one. But for now, it can stick around. I mentioned full booklet panes. Here's an example of one that's actually okay. When I got this cover, which is one of the favorites in my collection, I thought something couldn't be right. Who puts a massive booklet pane like that on an envelope? But the details told the story. This was actually mailed on a long weekend. It's mailed to a legal firm. So I think somebody had to get legal documents to the lawyers and they maybe got caught out by the long weekend. The post offices aren't open. You can get these booklets from the vending machines out the front. So they bought the booklet from the vending machine. Um, I can see Heidi shaking her head. I'm Have just you lost saying, me? what a story. What a oh, story. sorry. I thought you were saying, I, I thought I was telling the story and no one could hear me. No, um, no, no. So, yeah, so they've, they've, oh, well, that's what's going on. They've bunged the whole, uh, the whole booklet pane onto the envelope. They've scrawled urgent priority paid and I suspect they've dropped it into a street mailing box. Normally, if you went to a, a, for priority paid, you would have to take it to a post office. But the good news is on the back, which I didn't scan, the post office has caught the priority paid and they, the, the request and they've treated it as priority paid. Um, so this, it slightly overpays the priority paid rate, but uh, they knew what they were doing and it worked. Um, the great Rod Perry saw this cover and said it was a lovely thing to own, but he, he, did, he said he wouldn't add it to the... Um, the Brosden White catalogs we have here, which by the way are great specialist catalogs that include a price for stamps on cover. Yes, he said he wouldn't include this as a listing in the catalog because it would just imply that there are others out there to be found, which he didn't think there were. And that really also gets home the fact that you can actually own things that are every bit as scarce as the one cent magenta British Guiana stamp that billionaires pay millions of dollars for. But I picked this up for a few bucks. So um, it's scarcity is, Everything is a, like a, a one off stamp is just as scarce as a one off cover. The only difference is, is the market does the market recognize how scarce this material is? And in the case of covers, the answer is not yet. So there's plenty of time to get amongst it, build yourself a nice collection of commercial covers, and there might be a bit of upside for you to enjoy. I'm just about wrapping up. 
the only question is, what are you going to collect? You can collect by a nation or by an era or by a topic, of course. You can collect whatever you like. Whatever you can collect on stamps, collect it on cover as well. I would suggest starting small. Don't try to collect everything or your cupboard will be bursting like mine is pretty soon. Uh, I would suggest, though, that you pick a, a set or an era that has a variety of values because that makes it a lot more fun to chase than just everything being the standard letter rate. And please store them properly. Speak to your stamp dealer. Treat them properly. Don't let them get toned and, and eaten by silverfish. That's not, we want to, that's not what collectors of the future would want to see. Now, I haven't written a slide for it, but yesterday on the internet, someone said, where do you get them? I can tell you I've got my covers from stamp auctions, for, uh, online auctions. I've got them from real world auctions, from stamp dealers at stamp shows, stamp clubs. Um, friends give them to me. Of course, they come in the post. Work uh, collected them in offices. And I'd, be, I'd be lying if I said I've never fished one out of a recycling bin or a rubbish bin if I saw a nice one. Uh, if you're on eBay, look for me. I don't actually have anything up there at the moment, but that's me on eBay, Kingston Covers. Look for the king with the goggly eyes. Uh, I do have a bit of this material that I hope to offload over the next couple of months and some earlier material as well. And in the meantime, next time you're looking up WikiHow to find out how to cut a stamp and soak a stamp off a cover, <laughs> don't! Please don't. If you missed the plug at the start of the talk, I am punkphiletalist.com. Please come on over and uh, and join in. I don't mind a bit of controversy. You're allowed to come on over and hate what I wrote. People do that on a regular basis. And that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry if I went a tad over time. Um, I will take questions, although I should say I'm not particularly an expert in the field. I'm just an enthusiastic collector, but hey, we can have a chat. <laughs> yes. My sentiment, so, exactly. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. Take in your applause. Put on your camera, please, please. And you can stop sharing your screen. That'll help. Oh, that was just delightful, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great. Definitely. Especially for anyone who's, you know, has an affinity for covers, which I do. But uh, okay. Uh, clap, clap. <laughs> That's cute. All right, friends. I'm going to take a moment and just scroll real quickly because I think there was some nice uh, back and forth volleying that was done between each other. Um, yeah, I don't see, because James Gavin was there to help Mark Bailey. So, friends, uh, it, it, I, I can look at you. Okay. Uh, it, would anybody in, like to say something? I'm scanning the audience. How did, oh, James, would you like to ask your own question? Go ahead, honey, and un unmute yourself so we can hear you. Hi. So, um... So I recently got into stamp collecting. Uh, my dad gave me oh, his well, older well. collection when he was a kid, and then um, yes. and so I have like a couple um, like regular sheets. I'm currently in Japan right now because that's where my dad works, but I'm wow. from um, America. Fantastic. So I have some Japanese sheets, and I'm like wondering how how would one um, go about storing these and collecting these? Should I put them on envelopes? Should I use them or should I keep them in a sheet? Like, what's the best way to do that? Uh, you certainly wouldn't stick them on envelopes uh, unless you were actually going to mail them. But um, we use uh, the version I, the, you can buy what are called stock books. They're like albums made of cardboard and plastic. Um, and you can, yeah, yeah, exactly like that. Um, and that I think just from looking at that, looks like a good quality one. You have to steer clear of the cheaper brands. Yeah, this was my dad's older one payments, yeah, uh, acidic pages, I mean, they can hurt the stamps. Um, a system that I use, uh, it's, I use, I refer to it by a brand name, they're called Hagna Sheets, but there's a few different brand names, Prins is another one. Essentially, they are like um, loose leaf sheets of cardboard, which have the plastic strips attached. Put your stamps in them, and then you keep them all in a folder. What I like about that is that you can just rearrange pages in any order. So if you if you if you happen to buy a, a stamp that you for some reason you think needs to go in between two others you already own instead of having to rearrange your whole stamp album you can just buy a, or pick a, another sheet of these uh these stock sheets we call them sorry it took 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 it a while for my brain to work so we I, I use stock sheets and you can you just fill a folder with these stock sheets and when the folder can take no more you just go and buy another folder and buy another packet of 10 stock sheets they come usually in packets of 10. Um, 
if you, you look had, above Rick Howell's showing you what it yeah, is. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, you can see, see that. Yeah. Yes, yes. I didn't have yeah. mine handy to show you. So, um, yeah, that's a good example from the uh, uh, one out and show us there and show what it shows what it looks like. And during, My are in another room at the during this little interim, James, I would be remiss if I didn't say, and I put it in the chat to go check out stamps.org that, and, uh, and then yeah. sort of check out Graham's videos on YouTube. Yeah, I actually, that's how I got back into a uh, stamp. Like I, I learned about stamp collecting is from exploring stamps. Yeah. James, it's, um, fantastic. Keep, keep watching exploring stamps and, uh, and it will tell you everything, you know, James, it's um, James from the Rhodesian Study Circle. Um, if you're looking to use modern stamps postally, go have to check out on Instagram. Um, there's a lot of uh, like postcard and envelope um, people that swap them. And so if you can get modern stamps used on the correct rate within the period of release, um, that's a really good way to get used commercially used covers. Um, but don't try and put a whole sheet on an envelope uh, just to make it used because then it kind of becomes a philatically um, contrived cover. So look, look oh, at okay. Instagram. Yeah, Instagram's got some great resources. Yeah, I'm actually trading with, uh, I think he's on here, yeah, 7VIKJA9. I met mm -hmm. him on Reddit. I'm sending him some stamps and we're going to trade. So I'm, yeah, check I'm, with your I'm post. trying to do that already. Yeah, check with your post offices, find out what the rates are for posting, which you probably get online, and then just find the values that match up and use it within the correct period. Well, yeah, That'll it's actually 80, 84 yen. May I ask one more question? By all means, please. Okay, so if I'm sending it to uh, people, is it worth anything to keep? So I have like friends and family um, in America and stuff, so is it should I break like a sheet like this or sh is it better to keep it intact if mm -hmm. I'm going to actually use it for regular postage? I, I, the ideal in terms of it turning it into something that's really worth collecting, uh, you should want to put exactly the right amount of postage on the envelope. So even though the full sheet does look absolutely gorgeous and you could still hang on to it, in terms of what stamp collectors will be looking for in the future, you would want to put as many stamps on it as it would take to actually as it would as it would cost for Japan Post to send that letter to America. So that that would involve breaking up a sheet list. But the bright side of that is that when postal authorities put out sheetlets like this, people very rarely actually buy them and break them up and put them on the mail. So your friend will actually end up with probably something that's a little bit scarce just because you've actually gone and broken up a sheetlet. All right, thank you. Good, I'm glad that you asked your questions, James. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for watching. And, uh, Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, we, uh, well, hold on one second, CJ, uh, for Glenn S. Yep. Okay, use part of the sheet border also, is what he's saying. You have great advice. And then just to go back real quickly, James, do be aware of humidity. I don't know how Japan is, but do be aware of that. And oh, yeah, it gets very humid in the summers. So I, I, in I, about a month, it's going to be covered in. And I reckon humidity. that's why the person they, you know, philatelists are so they're so smart. They knew. Yes. OK, Japan and anything. OK, go ahead, CJ. Well, um. I, I liked your section on, uh, you know, is it really is it really a commercial cover or is it philatelic? So I get a lot of mail um, that is junk mail and it's not canceled. Yeah. So uh, how yeah. do you feel when you see these? Um, do you ever find envelopes that aren't can with postage that isn't canceled, but it did go through the mail? Yes, I I do. Um, I hang on to them if there's some way that you can tell that it went through the mail like if if any kind of postal markings have shown up anywhere else on the cover but basically i'm on the hunt for stamps that are tied to the cover with a postmark um anything less than that i these days um, unfortunately there's a lot of it these days um, i'm throwing out a lot of stuff i used to be able to go to my post office and ask them to cancel the mail for me if it arrived in my in my post box 
and they would used to be happy to do that retrospectively. But um, these days, I think they've got very touchy about doing that because they worry that I might be trying to claim to someone else that I sent the mail at this particular date. So I find that's that's wow. getting harder and harder to do. And I need to look for postal staff that don't know the rules. But um, <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately, it's just one of the one of the it's not, I didn't mention it in the talk, but one of the huge frustrations of trying to collect commercial covers is so much mail comes through the mail, uh, comes through the post now on without getting any kind of markings whatsoever. It's an enormous, enormous shame. And except, so, of course, except, of course, it's all crossed out with biro, felt pen, and other hand that's items. That's right. I've actually recently started to include those covers in my collection. I don't like having to do that, but it is. As with all postal history, it's showing you how the mail is being treated in this day and age. In the year 2020, I have a couple of covers with enormous black felt tip textures through them. Of course, if I get one with a postmark, the felt tip text, the felt, te sorry, I used a brand name that we use in Australia, but the felt tip marker, the covers, I, I would love to replace them when I can. But in the meantime, I've, I have come to appreciate that this is modern postal history. I hate it, but it is, <laughs> but it is. Um, sorry, to get back to CJ for a moment, the only problem with, uh, well, no, several problems with uncancelled mail. The trouble is you can't tell that the stamp hasn't been applied at a later date. And you do occasionally get covers where you look at them and think that stamp was not the original stamp on that cover. And if a uh, stamp, the tied is the word that we use, if a stamp isn't tied to the cover with the postmark, then it's just going to be a bit hard to argue in future that it was there to start with which is why post offices should be using postmarks. I don't think you're yeah, going to get anybody disagreeing on that one. No, and certainly when hey, it comes CJ, to... CJ, I loved your chat the other day too. Go and watch CJ's talk about forgers and the forgeries and the people behind them. What was that, Mark Bailey? Yes, I'd just like to say this point that, uh, that Gerard's making about um, cancellations tying the stamp to the cover. That's one of the things that expertization services look for. If they're asked to expertise a thing, is this genuine? You know, does this stamp belong on this cover? You know, if all they've got is some, uh, if they haven't got any postmark at all, or some pencil markings that any fool could have put on there, then you know, it makes it difficult to uh, to give a, a an expert opinion that it's genuine. That's right. Where do you have your most fun hunting for? Your ephemera, your covers. Uh, my most fun hunting is trying to get to stamp shows nice and early before everyone else gets there. And it used to be that decimal cover collectors, we didn't have to rush very quickly there. But these days you do have to get in early because it's become such a big field now that you, <laughs> you, really, you really want to get there as early as you can and grab all the good stuff. Uh, I also love finding stuff online. Um, I do buy an auction. Sometimes I, well, in the past, I have bought sort of entire boxes of hundreds of covers from auction. I really need to get rid of a bunch of them now <laughs> because I have too many of them. So that's why I've started specializing in certain issues instead of collecting everything. But um, yeah, online, I love fossicking through through uh, eBay or Del Cam or uh, some of the other hip stamps, some of the other services because the craziest stuff turns up, particularly in other countries, and often for not much money. So um, it's it's good fun. It's dangerous to go on eBay, actually. We've heard that before too. That's right. And of course, stamp store. Yes, which I was going. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. There are. There, I I said that in the beginning. Over three hundred thousand pieces of ephemera and stamps. For sure. Absolutely. It is fun. I must when confess, I... Stamp Store has only recently landed on my radar thanks to your recent efforts during coronavirus. And I had my first browse through the other day, and I will be having many more. Righteous. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it is fun. That's, I, I, until tonight, I didn't, you gave me an entirely new appreciation of like contemporary, but I was looking for the, um, the disinfectant mail and found some on Stamp Store, which was pretty cool. All right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I have to say the uh, what annoys me when I'm shopping online is when a, a site 
lumps all covers in together and then you have to scroll through all the first day covers and all the commercial mail and all that boring stuff to look for the good juicy stuff. If you're a dealer, please try to separate your commercial covers from the other ones. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> All right, friends. Well, you have two minutes. Now's your chance. We've got the punk philatelist online. If there's anything that you'd like to ask him, otherwise, I'm just going to probably stroke ego because it, it you just, you bring an enthusiasm and it's really fun to. Th th I think that this sort of collecting is definitely something that's appealing. Um, you know, I know I don't want to be stepping on anybody's toes here, but I, I I think that it's an exciting way to collect, and it's got a lot of potential to to grab kids. I mean, they're so they're colorful, and you can tell a story, and the detective work is so much fun that you can do. And yeah, uh, it's, the detective work is something I really really enjoy about collecting commercial covers, and um, and particularly now that letters just aren't as common as they used to be. To see them arrive from the seventies and the eighties when they had all kinds of stamps and stickers attached. They're, they're great fun to look at. They are. And as for the enthusiasm, I think the enthusiasm is, is bubbling at the moment online. I'm seeing faces on this screen who I love reading and, and watching on Instagram or YouTube. And, and um, I, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's, I love hearing other people share what they're into. So thank you for giving me the chance to do that. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And we are running out of time, friends. I, I apologize for that. We do have Foster Miller is on the line from the first uh, day cover. So even those of us who do collect first day covers also collect commercial covers of the issues we collect. So uh, I know, James, you'll have to subscribe. You'll have to watch Punk Philatelist on uh, Twitter and you can get in touch with him there. It is eight o'clock and we do try to end promptly to respect everyone's time. Thank you very much. Good morning to our friends, James, Gavin, and to the Punk Philatelist. Thank you so much. And I would be remiss. I, I see my friends waving. Uh, Tom Bionushek, excuse me if I butchered your name, man, but he will be presenting on Monday, the APS Stamp Chat. He'll be presenting on Bolivia, and I got a sneak preview of his presentation, and Viva Bolivia, seriously. You will be singing that by the end of his talk. Uh, on that note, please enjoy a refreshing weekend. Remember to check out stamps.org. There's always a ton of great information. We've got writers on board that are full of energy, a lot of passion. You know, Susana on our team, she's, you know, a young person with, with, with just a, a, t a ton of philatelic interests. So she's really behind that, that engine. And we appreciate everything that she's contributing every day. So check out stamps.org. Leave your comments in the YouTube video once it's begun recorded. If there's anything that you'd like to see on Stamps Chat or if you want to give a shout out or somehow you want to keep in touch, use those comments in the YouTube and do subscribe to the APS YouTube so you can be notified when a new stamp chat is up and ready for you. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for your continued membership, shopstamps.org. And we will see you on Monday at three o'clock for Viva Bolivia. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Pump. Have a good weekend, Noah. Yes, thank okay. you, friends. Thanks, Noah. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye